Greetings, my name is Louise Dente and I welcome you to yet another edition of Cultural Caravan. When this edition is a special as we talk about strategies to basically develop greater self-esteem in success with children of color. And we're joined by a very special guest. Her name is Kalila Brand. She is the founder of Creed, and she is also known as an anti-racist and equity educator, curriculum developer, consultant, cultural ambassador. Welcome to the Cultural Caravan, Thank Kalila. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. And, uh, you know, I had the privilege of uh, meeting you a couple of weeks back, and I said, we got to have her with Cultural Caravan, particularly as it relates to our children. And that's a passion for me in terms of how do we support and, and develop children who are healthy and able to deal with the world as it is. Let's first start off talking about you. Um, what encouraged you to get into education and to become an anti-racist um, and equity educator? So um, I always wanted to be a teacher. Um, when I was in high school, my 11th grade year, my junior year, uh, we had a teacher come to my school, Mr. Johnson. I didn't know at the time that he was as young as he was. I found out he was 25 when he came. Mm -hmm. um, and so he came as our history teacher and he began to, he, he started teaching black history classes, which we had never had. So he was my US history teacher and my black history teacher and he just changed like my world by introducing me to a, a pan-African um, identity. And I made the decision that year, that junior year, I had a black male teacher, Mr. Johnson, and I had a white female teacher, Miss Johnson. They weren't married, they weren't um, related. Um, and she taught English, and I just, I fell in love with black history. Mm -hmm. um, I was born in the Caribbean and then came here as a young child, and so um, black history wasn't this thing that that was great until that time. And then I decided to become a history teacher. Mm -hmm. And I taught history and English in the New York City Public Schools for 10 years. Um, and at the end of that time, I had moved up the ladder. I was in, leadership, in a leadership role and realized that th there was some other work that needed to be done. Mm. Now, particularly as an educator, and obviously you realized that there was something else that not only did children need, but also the teachers needed. Um, let's deal with this historically. When we talk about the impact of racism on our children, talk to us from a historical perspective. Why is this type of support needed? So first of all, our public school system um, in America was never created for any child, black, white, any child to self identify and be proud of themselves. If we, if we do the history of public education in, in the United States, it starts on the East Coast, and it starts with um, trying to socialize immigrants from South Europe, from Southern Europe, mm -hmm. right? And so our public schools were created like factories, mm -hmm. and it was about taking these people who were deemed less than, mm -hmm. Southern Europeans, so Italians and, and all of those groups, um, Irish, they're not Southern, but Irish, the Italians, and making them human. So black, Latino, Asian, indigenous, we weren't even thought of when the public school system was created. And it was about having them work for people who had money, the people of industry at the turn of the century. When you move years forward and you talk about integration in 1955, so you have this system that's just about people falling in line and you integrate the system with groups of people who have been seen as non-human, as less than, as like the worst thing in the world. You integrate them into the system. All you want them to do is like everyone else, just turn into little robots, mm -hmm. but you really don't even see them as human beings. Mm -hmm. And so we integrated humans putting black and white students together, but we didn't integrate the curriculum. We didn't integrate the pedagogy. We didn't integrate the teaching staff. You know, I, I say, and people really get upset with me, but integration was one of the worst things that ever happened to black education. We lost all of our principals, all of our teachers, all of our schools, and all of our sense of pride. 
to be sitting in a classroom with white students. Mm -hmm. Now, some people say, wait a minute, what do you mean we lost? I mean, you know, there were lots of people who sacrificed, who fought and died to uh, integrate, to get uh, opportunities. For those who might question the loss, what is it that we lost? So I would say for those who, who use that line of thinking, they clearly never studied the civil rights movement. The civil rights movement was not about integration. That is what we ended up having. It was about us being able to be equal at the table. It was about economics and it was about political and social opportunities. It was, the civil rights did not start because we wanted to sit next to white kids in a school. That was not the start of the civil rights. It was about how do we get economic, political, and social equity in this society. And what they ended up with was integration. Mm -hmm. So we would all have to do our, um, un unlearn mm -hmm. the history that we've been taught and really learn. Mm -hmm. So now what did we lose? Literally, we lost hundreds of teachers. We lost hundreds of principals. A person who was a principal in an all black school could then become the, 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 the lunch maid mm -hmm. in the white school. Mm -hmm. So now we lose those jobs. That means we lose economic access. Um, we lose that stature. We lost our neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. I, I would ask that person, what did we gain from integration? Let's talk about the impact of this, particularly of racism on our children and later integration. So just start with, let's say, racism. How did that impact our children, particularly the education of our children? Um, not even did, it does. You know, the number one group of students suspended um, in our country are black boys. The number two are black girls. Then we go to Latino boys, um, indigenous boys, white boys, and then we meet the rest of the girls. So one, in our discipline procedures and our behaviors, our students are pushed out. They like to say our students drop out, they're pushed out of school because of ways of being that the dominant teaching force sees as threatening. Then too, there's a curriculum that does that only centers whiteness and particularly white male. So everyone else is othered and seen as less than. When do you learn traditionally about black people in your curriculum? Black History Month, if you're lucky. When do you learn about Latino people? Hispanic Heritage Month, if you're lucky, because that's in September and October, and teachers are like, there's too much to do, I can't fit it in. When do we learn about any Asian ethnic group um, in our curriculum? We center everything in what the white man has conquered and Columbus and done. So what does that do for the positive racial identity development of anyone who does not fall into that alignment? If we even simply look at white women, when do you see white women in our curriculum? You don't, so that whatever is not present is ignored and automatically seen as less than. The ways of being, the way that people of color speak, interact, um, learn, is not included in the teaching and learning. Mm -hmm. So our students don't have access. Um, when we think about, particularly as you say, we, we, we say that this challenge we have, particularly as educators, to support building self-esteem of children who, like us, are impacted by slavery, by racism, by white supremacy. What strategies, what needs to happen, particularly as relates to the parent, as we're talking to parents, the educator, the teacher, and what do we need to do to change that? So that's a multi a multi prong answer. Mm -hmm. I, I like that you said strategies and take it back because it's not a strategy. Culturally responsive education is not a strategy. Mm -hmm. It is a way of being. It's how you approach how you teach. Um, when I, my first year of teaching history, ninth grade, it was my first year, students loved my class and we got to slavery. One of my favorite students, a young man who had been sitting in the front of the class the whole year, just had been a lovely student. When we got to slavery, eventually moved himself to the back of class. Mm -hmm. By day three, I'm like, what's wrong? And I asked him, what's going on, what's wrong? And he said to me, I don't wanna learn about this S. Mm -hmm. You know, we slaves, we ain't never been ish, we ain't never gonna be ish, I don't wanna learn about it. Um, and I realized I was the problem 
I was I realized at that moment I had messed up mm -hmm. because I started the black identity at slavery mm -hmm. which is what we all do mm -hmm. when the black identity does not and and even let me be really clear the African identity does not start at slavery and he taught me he'd forever changed my practice that when I start teaching my students in September regardless if I'm teaching a history class or an English class um, an economics class a health class I've taught all of those I always start with the out of Africa theory and I start with an African identity that allows students to see themselves um, way more and way bigger and where more greater than slavery then then slavery becomes something that happened in this long continuum mm -hmm. of an African identity. Mm -hmm. You know, often when I work with teachers, especially teachers of the diaspora, I said we have to focus on where the ship picked us up from, not where it dropped us off at. Mm -hmm. So I, I try to push teachers and parents to grow in their consciousness around how we identify because words have power. And I'm always like, I'm black, I'm, I'm proud, I love black, I'm all of this. And I also understand that I, I need to represent the Africanness that I, I come from too, because that gives me the opportunity to extend it. So what do we need to do as parents and as teachers? We have to ensure the positive racial identity development through education of our black and brown students. Um, everything in our society is socialized for them to see themselves as less than. If we're talking about white supremacy, we're talking about anti-blackness. The two go hand in hand. There's, and then there's the continuum that colorism takes us. So if we know everything is being socialized in white supremacy, from the time our children come out of the womb, we must be socializing them with a positive racial identity in their Africanness and in their blackness, just so they end up somewhere in the middle. Now, I know that from past experiences, and I know you've done a, pre a presentation recently when you talked about perceptions of Africa. And that is key, too, because if people don't perceive Africa yes. in a positive way, Absolutely. even trying to take them there is going to be, me, I'm not African. And you know we've all heard that. So I know, and maybe you could talk to the audience about how we're taught, even from a geographic way, about Africa. Maybe you can share that with them what Africa so you know what you're alluding to is I always put up a map of the world a traditional map of the world that we always see and I ask people how is this map racist and everybody's like what what do you mean and people give different answers about locations and things of that nature but the one of the main answers is that on this typical map Africa is not as large as it is in real, in the real world, along with the fact of the orientation that white countries or European countries are at the top and countries of color at the bottom, and the world is a sphere, so there is no top and no bottom, but that's deep, right? So this idea that you can fit most of the continents, most of the landmass on Earth inside of Africa, how huge it is. So just getting people to understand that our socialization of Africa and its minimization starts really early. Um, and when you look at something, when you look, like a, look at a movie like The Black Panther, mm -hmm. that gives you an opportunity to see Africa and Africans, even though Wakanda's not real, right? <laughs> it gives you an opportunity to see Africa in a different way. And most of us, um, I've been lucky enough to visit the continent I'm continent and I'm gonna go back really soon. Um, our pictures and what we see of Africa, I have friends that live in mansions. Mm -hmm. Like we never get to see the beauty, the beauty of um, African nations. Mm -hmm. We just see little kids with flies and that is just so overdone. Getting back to the whole thing of perceptions of Africa, we talked about the fact people's perception, particularly African, history, getting our children to understand that the, the marvels of Africa, unfortunately in the curricula, does not talk about that. How in terms of instilling positive about themselves, particularly in a very racist environment, what are some of the strategies in terms of parents reinforcing that from a parent perspective before they, which I always see parents are the first teacher. Yes. What can parents do? So we're sitting in an independent African-centered Montessori school where my office is, my offices are, right? And as you look around in this room, these two, and, two through six year olds, first of all, their parents made a conscious decision mm -hmm. to place their child in an independent African-centered school, mm -hmm. right? Um, 
when, if you, if you look, the camera can't see, they're learning about Tanzania right now. Mm -hmm. So it's, their learning about Africa is natural. Mm -hmm. We're learning about our countries, we're learning about our cultures, we're learning about language. Mm -hmm. It's not something that you're like, oh, let me tell you about this. No, it's how mm -hmm. I'm learning. So I say parents have to indoctrinate their children with a positive sense of where they come from, from the time they're born. That means making sure that their dolls and their books and their um, cultural activities are steeped in an African-centered way. So when I was a child, I took dance class, I took ballet, I took tap, I took jazz. My mother didn't want me in African dance. Why not? That just wasn't dance, right? I needed both ballet and African dance. Mm -hmm. I needed to learn how to play the, the djembe drum along with playing the piano. Like mm -hmm. we have to understand as parents that our culture is rich and that you have to be explicit and, and, and intentional about putting your kids in these activities, no matter how much they complain. All kids complain, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. But when they are in their 20s and 30s, they're gonna say, oh God, thank goodness that I had this foundation that centered um, my family, my food, our festivities, our language, and our culture. Mm -hmm. So I think that's where we have to start. I, I work with a lot of parents who, who are stressed out about where their children are gonna to go to school. They want their kids to have the best learning opportunity. And I agree. I don't know if I agree with their metrics because the metrics is usually steeped in white supremacy, right? And, and I know and research shows that when your children of color are constantly the minority in a space with whiteness, it affects them intellectually, it affects them emotionally. And those two things are hard to come back from. Mm -hmm. So your child has great diction, but they have a strong sense of self-hatred. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, I'll switch. Now that's something, and, and we talk about, first of all, the parent has to be knowledgeable, and that's one thing. If the parent does not have a sense of self-esteem, understanding their culture, and them, they themselves are in denial of their uh, their their Africa, and will not accept that part of them, that 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 Africa, then the child is going to have those issues. And certainly, as you said, taking the role as parent, our responsibility as parents, and, I, and to me, I think. Not just, even if you're not a biological parent, we are the parent. We are, we take ownership. These are our children, regardless of they're biological or not. So taking that responsibility of being that quote unquote auntie, you know, that whole village mindset that we are responsible for educating and providing that support. So that's definitely key. And then um, I know that one of the things that you spoke about in another conversation was that whole uh, historic Kenneth Clark, um, the doll uh, st study, which um, tell us about that study for those who are not familiar with the study and the impact it had on understanding what some of our children are faced with. So the Clarks, um, we always talk about uh, the, the man, Kenneth, but his wife was a doctor also, mm -hmm. and they did this study together. Um, at the time of integration to see the effects of integration on our kids' psychological development. Mm -hmm. They would put a black doll and a white doll. The dolls were identical except for the color of their skin. And they would ask um, children as young as three, as old as eight, to identify specific attributes. Uh, who's the nice doll? Who's the bad doll? Who's the smart doll? Who's the funny doll? And overwhelmingly, the black and white children would give all of the positive attributes to the white doll and all the negative attributes to the black doll. And then it would always end with, and which doll do you look like? And there's always this moment where that black child has to then point at that black doll that they have heaped all of this negativity on and say, I'm, I look like that one, mm -hmm. right? As young as three years old. Mm -hmm. As young as three, mm -hmm. they recognize that to be black is mm -hmm. to be bad. Mm -hmm. So that we need to understand that we have work to do. Now this doll study has been done so many times mm -hmm. throughout the years, right? Mm -hmm. So from the 50s all the way, someone is doing it right now. Mm -hmm. And it, there's slight changes, but then it's also being um, complexified. They have used Latino children and Asian children and it comes 
the, the same results come out. Mm -hmm. So when I say white supremacy and anti-blackness, like let's be very clear that that's what it is mm -hmm. because all the children know that to be white is great and to be black is the worst thing that mm -hmm. you can do, which feeds into colorism. Mm -hmm. So I love the time that we're living in right now with, with the internet and social media mm -hmm. because I feel like, and teachers roll their eyes when I say that and parents, but I feel like there's such an opportunity to center and love blackness. Mm -hmm outside of the school. Now, I work to do it in schools, but I see that this, there's, a, there's a relationship and a, and, a, and a transaction happening where the kids get to like see themselves in all the beauty and the glory in, in their phones. Mm -hmm. um, and it causes real conflict in schools because now the kids are like, I don't know if that's true. I, don't, I think I have a problem. Why aren't we doing this? So I see it as a great opportunity. Um, but we have to realize that um, being socialized to hate blackness it's like the air that we breathe. Mm -hmm. Now, just getting back as we kind of wind down is the educator. As you know, you're an educator, I'm an educator. What are some of the strategies, particularly for those educators, let's say whether they're of African ancestry or not, that are teaching children of color? What strategies, what suggestions do you have for them? Um, I don't have a strategy. They have to change every single thing they do. Uh, there, there is no strategy to then be more like Afrocentric um, because your students will see right through that. Mm -hmm. um, just recently, Harry Belafonte was interviewed on PBS NewsHour for the 50th anniversary of Dr. King's assassination. And Harry Belafonte said, we're, we're, he's 91. He said, we're at the point where um, white people either need to realize what they're doing and stop it or black people need to burn it down. I was like, okay, Baba <laughs> Belafonte, I love it. And I, I take that I idea of burning it down, meaning that we have to decolonize our practices. Mm -hmm. Teachers are always asking me, what's the strategy, what's the strategy, what's the strategy? The strategy is you have to absolutely, totally change what you're doing mm -hmm. in order to do this right. If you have been diagnosed with diabetes, eating one carrot a day mm -hmm. is not going to help you change that diagnosis. Mm -hmm. You have to change everything about how you live. And so if you want to be a teacher that values the African diaspora, you have to change everything. You have to unlearn everything that you've learned. You have to read different books. You have to figure out, kids have been educated since we've had humans. Mm -hmm. Before white people invented public schools, children were learning. Mm -hmm. I, in my work, go back to the indigenous practices. The person who's doing the most talking is the person who's doing the learning. So having our kids actually talk and tell stories. When you're in school, the teacher lectures and you write down the notes. Mm -hmm. Decolonize that practice. Figure out how you get the kids to talk and talk about what it is that they need to learn. Um, we teach math one way the dead white man way. How did everybody else before white people invented school teach math? There are practices that work. Everything comes back to storytelling and creating community in a safe environment, and it comes back to experiences. And so when I work with teachers, they can't salvage most of their practices because all of their practices are steeped in white supremacy. So you're like, wow, if I want to do this, I have to stop doing all of the things that I, as a student, was good at. That's the problem, mm -hmm. that most teachers were great students, mm -hmm. and so they're like, it worked for me. It should work for you. But our kids are different. Um, this, the, the, the millennial generation, the generations after it, Generation Y, Generation Z, um, the changes in these generations are so quick. When you go back to the baby boomers, we didn't have TV, we didn't have technology, so these 25-year gaps were very similar. I um, was getting my, nail done, my nails done, and a two-year-old took their mom's phone, turned it on, went to YouTube, watched their videos. That two-year-old is not you when you were two, nor was that two-year-old me when I was two. And that two-year-old is gonna come into this classroom and is not gonna wanna sit on their booties for 18 minutes while you talk to them. They are independent, they can find information, they know what to do, they are like self-actualized. So how can we just put a strategy in for what this two-year-old does. It's impossible. Absolutely. And one of the things that I always say, like you say, being able to 
touch all the modalities. As you said, teachers have to understand we're dealing with techno babies. Even teaching culture, you have to do it from a dynamic way. You can't do the chalk and talk. You can't do the sit down. It has to be engaged. It has to be hands on. And I think, as you said, that we have to be willing to relearn some new strategies to, uh, to connect with the children that are coming in here. But definitely, I think, understanding that we have to, first of all, love ourselves, because children can pick that up, yes. and then show them that we love them yeah. through the things we yes. do. But I, I definitely agree that um, it's an ongoing process. Um, and certainly, we understand people and, and folks and particularly appreciate what you've done, which is dedicated your practice to supporting others to, first of all, understand the importance of identifying what the need is and basically making changes. While the remainder of time, um, could you tell those in the audience how they can connect with you and the work that you do if they want more information? So you can go to my website, CREED, which stands for Culturally Responsive Educators of the African Diaspora. Um, so it's not spelled the traditional way. It's C-R-E-A-D-N-Y-C.com. Um, and you can email me. You can look at our videos. You can look at our resources. We do a daily blog for educators and parents. We're on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, CREED NYC. And you can um, reach out. I just want to say on behalf of Cultural Caravan, we appreciate and salute the work you're doing, you, you and your team, and certainly look forward to our next follow-up conversation in our next uh, uh, cycle. But with that said, I want to thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Welcome, Joe Patan.